Let's bow before the Lord as we begin and pray together. You may know this uh, song, an old hymn. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands that wonderful key that will unclasp and set me free. Silently now we wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Father, we do ask that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. And speak, Lord, your servants are listening and give us a listening, a hearing heart. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for what you did for us on the cross. And Holy Spirit, for bringing the gospel to us with faith to believe. We love you, God, and we desire to love you more and more. And so we ask this in the name which is above every name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And hallelujah. Well, I'm Bubba Stahl. My wife, Beth, is here. We're Dr. Stahl's parents, <laughs> as some of you know. Uh, we do have two sons, Ben, of course, our oldest, Dan, our youngest. Uh, Dan is an orthopedic trauma surgeon at Scott and & White. And uh, our four grandchildren here in, in Bernie, Camille, who just got married to Ricky Rios. Actually, they live in Austin now. Camille works for uh, Young Life at uh, Westlake, then Emma, junior at A&M, and then uh, Charlie is a junior here at Bernie, and Olivia is a freshman here in Bernie, and then our three granddaughters in Temple, Chandler, who is also a junior at uh, uh, Westlake, I mean, uh, uh, Lake Belton High School, her little sister Reagan, who is in eighth grade, uh, and then the little one, Logan, who's in fourth grade. So that's our, our family. I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior, Trinity Baptist Church. I just met John and Carol. Buckner had just gotten there in 1959, and we were seeing so many people baptized, and we were having the Lord's Supper a lot, it seems like. And I'd been telling Daddy, Mom and Daddy, I wanted to get baptized for years. But one Sunday night on the way home from church, standing up in the seat next to my dad, Dick Stahl, I told Daddy again, I want to get baptized. He said, well, Bubba, you know, only people who have become a follower of Jesus, a Christian, are get baptized. And then he started sharing the scripture. And as soon as he did, I remember thinking, I already know this story. <laughs> I, I can tell this story. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and, and uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, as he was saying those scriptures that I knew, something was different that night on the way home from church. And what came into my mind, my, my heart, was a Sunday school class poster of Jesus on the cross with those two thieves on either side, dark, clouds, Roman soldier looking up at Jesus and sun, a sunbeam shining down and people mingling all around. And that's what picture I saw. And what I came to see in that was not that God so loved the world, but that he loved me. And I already knew that Jesus died on the cross for the whole world, but that night I came to the realization that Jesus Christ died for me personally. It's when Jesus became real to me. And I went over that many, many times, especially in junior high, because I would go up and rededicate my life every other Sunday. And, <laughs> and this was during the youth revival days of the 60s, the Jesus movement. And in Houston, they, we would have a youth rally every other week. And uh, so those counselors would counsel me. What are you, when were you saved? And when, when did you pray? And I said, I don't even remember praying. 
Well, you're probably not saved, so I had to say the prayer. But I came to really question that and then came to realize that you can pray by looking. You don't have to say words when you pray. In fact, you can say words and not be praying if you don't see. And that's what we just got through singing. And it's what this course on prayer is all about. That's why I call it the practice of praying. Now, I want to thank Pastor Jason and Pastor Daniel for inviting me and asking me to, to teach these three weeks. And Beth and I are are in the process of becoming members here, and we're grateful for that. You know, used to you just walk down the aisle, give me your phone number and your birthday, and you're in. <laughs> How are you joining? And the, now it's a process, and that's a good thing. I think that's a good, uh, good move that uh, is being made, and we are, we are grateful because to be able to serve under such godly servant leadership, spiritual leadership that, the God, is, that God has called here is really amazing. And we're just as excited as y'all are about what God is saying and doing. Well, I've got a little booklet for you that I've uh, revised over and over again, and this is the latest. And it's So I'm not going to be teaching all the material in this book, but I'm going to be teaching from it. It's yours. And the little outline that we're going to follow, I hope to make five points with you this evening. And uh, we want to get started with that. And I'll be referring to some scripture that's not in this handout. And so let's start with 1 King, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, a story that you're very familiar with, little Samuel. And uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, if you'd turn in your Bibles there to 1 Samuel chapter 3, and I would like to read verse 7 through 10, kind of jumps into the middle of the story, but you are familiar with it. Verse 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and calling at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Now this is one of the prayers I hope that you'll learn is speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And the reason is because Praying is a faithful response to the revelation of God of himself in his word. That's what praying is. Now, I'm purposely not saying prayer. That's the noun. Praying is verb. And praying is a practice. Like uh, medical practice. And I, I've got this on good authority. <laughs> Two of the best doctors in the world right now have told me this, because I've asked them, why do they call it a medical practice? And both quick to respond to say, it is a calling for lifelong learning to get better knowing you'll never be perfect at it. That's praying. It is a lifelong learning curve, a lifelong learning process that we will never perfect. Andrew Murray is one of my teachers, the old Scottish missionary of South Africa, big book on prayer. And he says, Ian e. Bound said the same, I'm not sure which one was quoting the other one. In the school of prayer, we're all nothing but beginners, and that's all we'll ever be. And it is an eternal activity that we are, will be engaged in forever because God will continue to reveal more and more of himself to us, calling us, inviting us into that community of love that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have enjoyed forever. Amen. Amen. And that is what prayer is. It is a faithful response. Now, when I say faithful, I know some kind of check out and say, well, I'm not too faithful. Well, uh, faith is... Faith is 
receiving or believing that what God has said is true so that what God has said He will do because He is faithful. God is faithful to His own Word. He always does what He says, and He always says it first because God works according to His Word. He spoke in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, void, and darkness on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Then God said, what did He say? Let there be light. And what happened? He did it. But He did it after He said it. He only does what He does after He says what He does. And in His own timing. And in His own way. But the uh, what I want to cover, hopefully tonight, is a kind of a definition of praying, getting into a little bit of content. Next week, more of content, and the third week, more practice. But, uh, but, but understanding that, that faith, here's Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the message of Christ. Now, growing up, I learned that first, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. But in, in the original language, it's the message of Christ. And remember the context, Romans 10, 9, 10, 11, the section on the, answering the question, what about Israel? And Christ, the Messiah, that's the Old Testament. And the message of Christ, very particular words that Paul uses to communicate a Jewish understanding of the fulfillment of God's Word in Jesus Christ. The message of Christ is the promise of the coming of Messiah. But here's the point. When the gospel comes to us, it comes as grace, we know, a gift, but with it and in it come the faith to believe. Amen again. You don't have to say amen. I, I will. <laughs> because I'm, I'm enjoying it. So... So it's by grace are you saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, that refers to both grace and faith. It comes in the package. Now, we choose to believe. We are free to choose, and not everybody will be saved. Not everybody will choose to receive. But when you receive that gift, it comes with faith. But here's the point. It comes from hearing now, I've got uh, James chapter 1, a, another passage you're very familiar with. Count it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect work so that you may lack nothing. And if any may lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously and without reproach, but let him ask with faith. Let him ask believing. For he who is without faith is like the wave tossed and driven by the wind. Let not this, he's a double-minded man. Let not this man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. And so praying is a faithful response to the revelation of who God is in the world. Now the reason I say that is because sometimes we get the idea that praying is what, we're, what God is supposed to do for us. You think about your prayer list or maybe some prayer meetings that you've been in and it's like, God, here's what we need for you to do today. And uh, that's not what praying is about. Praying is not about, or we'll go to the God and say, what do you want me to do today? Oh, God, what do you want me to do? Or we're faced with a decision. I just, want, I just need to know what you want me to do, Lord. I want to do your will. Once I know it's your will, it's a no-brainer. But just show me what you want. God's... That's, we're asking God the wrong question. He's not interested in telling you what to do. He wants you to know Him and what He wants to do. It's a radical change, it was in my life anyway, in understanding the practice of praying. It's an invitation of God to know Him. That's why that verse 7 in 1 Samuel 3 is so important. Samuel didn't know the Lord because the Word of God had not yet been given to him. And what God desires 
in this fellowship is what we call prayer, praying. What God desires is for us to know Him. Because here's what's going to happen. When we begin to study what, the, what God's Word is re- revealing about Himself, we'll discover that He desires for you to be with Him. You know, we say it all the time, God loves you. And it's almost like we've lost the understanding of it. Uh, who, I can, ask you, I can answer this question and I can answer it. Who do you love? And I can tell you the answer. The person you want to be around. <laughs> Probably because you know they love you. <laughs> and you want to be around somebody like that. You're at ease with them. You're comfortable. You enjoy it. You're not keeping track of time. Oh, <laughs> when do we go? No. You love them, they love you. God desires you to know him so that you can come to see how much he desires fellowship with you. God really does want you to know him and how much he really enjoys your presence in his presence. Why? Because God knows what he does when you're in his presence. He changes you. And everything God blesses us with, because a lot of our prayers, oh Lord, bless me, bless me here, bless me. Until we realize that every blessing of God has the opportunity to change us to become that. Remember what Jesus taught in the, in the model prayer? Uh, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. What's the greatest blessing we have? Forgiveness. Why did God give us forgiveness? So that we would become forgiving people. Because as we forgive, then God is known as the one who has forgiven. Okay, well, praying is a learned experience. That's point number two. Praying is a learned activity in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, of course, the famous uh, verse, I, I've given it to you as a prayer to learn. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach me to pray. And as I said, we will, we're on an eternal learning curve. We will learn to pray. It's a learned activity because it is uh, within a family. And, again, w- this is not to get things done. You know, I... I I endured boring prayer because I wanted revival. I wanted to see revival, and I knew that prayer precedes revival, and so I've endured hours and hours of boring prayer. Oh, good grief. Because I wanted the outcome of revival. Then I learned, good grief, I was missing the revival because prayer is revival. And I thought, I'm missing something here. And I decided to learn what is this praying, this fellowship with God. Knowing someone is a learning experience. And it's because God takes the initiative to reveal himself to us. He wants us to to know him. Well, and of course, you learn by example. And Jesus Christ is the greatest example. We'll see some of that in in the weeks to come. But the Apostle Paul and in his letters, he would always talk about how he was praying. And uh, Dick Stahl, my father, he was my example of praying. He'd get up, he's an early riser, and he'd have his quiet time early in the morning. And uh, uh, the last conscious thing he did was to pray for his grandchildren there in that hospital room before he went to be with the Lord. And so he, he was an example for me in, in uh, learning to pray. And there is, of course, content, and we want to see that from the Scripture. But uh, praying is, point number three, praying is an enjoyable uh, activity with God in His Word. And this is what I missed for so long. Good grief. You know, in junior high and high school, I was taught about the quiet time. I already knew what it was, but I was going to the classes. And he said, okay, you need to have a special place you go, special time, open Bible, and a prayer list. Okay, got it. Read three chapters a day, five on Sunday, 
and then go through your prayer list. So, man, I would read the, and the King James Bible, you know, back in those days. Read those chapters. Good grief, I didn't have a clue what I was reading. I, you know, sometimes, Lord, if you make your Bible a little easier to understand, maybe people would read it more, you know. I'd wade through that. And then I was taught to pray one hour. And they used the scripture in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, could not you tarry with me one hour? Okay, so we've got to pray one hour. Okay, thank you, Lord, for my life. Thank you for my parents. Thank you for my home. Thank you I don't live in China or <laughs> Africa or Russia. Save all the lost people. Bless all the missionaries. Let us win on Friday night. I want to make a lot of tackles. Help me. Maybe an interception. Maybe a touchdown at the last second. 59 minutes to go. <laughs> Good grief. So I'll go back over that again. And then always feeling guilty about not praying enough. It was so boring. Well, somewhere along the line, I began to be taught. I have many good teachers. Dallas Willard's one of my teachers, John Piper, and of course the old guys, the classic guys, Andrew Murray. Uh, now Pastor Jason Smith's one of my newest teachers. <laughs> Boy, I'm learning so much. But uh, somewhere along the line, I began to realize that joy is the main characteristic of a child of God. Because he's loved and of well-being. Joy is the pervasive sense of well-being. I'm loved. Nothing can change that. I am enabled to love others. And the more I do, the more joy I have. And, and, and in this conversation with God that he has invited me into, there is great joy. It is the superior pleasure of eternity that we can experience now. Everything else is counterfeit that we would think of as pleasurable. The experience with God as he invites us into a conversation with him is the highest pleasure you can experience. And it comes fleeting which will be eternal and eternally growing. But here's what this means. The thing that I've got to learn in prayer for it to be that is to learn how to listen, which we have a hard time doing. Now, just let me throw it out there, and I'll try to repeat your answers, not calling your name, of course, but why are we such Poor listeners. Other than we talk too much. What, what's, why are we slow to learn how to listen? Selfish. Did you say selfish? Yeah, Self-absorbed. Self yeah, we're more interested in what we're going to say. We, we're not interested in others. You know, I've always had a hard time remembering names until October 1971 algebra class. I looked across the room and saw Beth looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to meet her. And I went over to her and very shyly said, my name is Bubba, what is yours? She very quietly said, Beth. And I didn't have to ever ask her to say it again. <laughs> now you may tell me your name. You have to tell me three or four times, maybe ten times. Why did I get her name? I was interested in her, which, by the way, will also help you in memorizing God's Word. Memorizing God's Word is not a mental exercise. 
It's a love experience. And when you love, <laughs> you don't even have to think about remembering. <laughs> You'll have it because of who is saying it. Well, back to prayer is primarily a listening experience. Of course, because God initiates it. God begins it. It begins in His Word. I really like the way uh, Pastor Jason and Daniel have arranged this. First the gospel, then your identity, then the Bible, then praying. Because it follows that. And, and, and praying comes after the revelation of God, of Himself, in His Word. Now, God also reveals Himself in nature. We know that. Not as clearly as in His Word. Mostly in, fully in Jesus Christ. That the Bible uh, reveals. The Old Testament promises Christ. The Gospels present Christ. The book of Acts proclaims Christ. The letters, Romans to Jude, explain the life of Christ in the life of the believer. And the book of Revelation promises a return. But it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. But whether you're in nature or even a tragedy, even a trial, God will speak to you in that trial. We could have testimonies that go for a long time. When something terrible is happening, God, what are you saying to me? I'm all ears. I'm listening. Boy, back there in March of 2020, they said shut down everything. Boy, I started getting texts and emails and phone calls. What's the Lord saying? What's the Lord saying? I said, yeah, I'm asking the same question. And I happened to be in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 37, Zedekiah, Nebuchadnezzar bearing down. Zedekiah sent word to Jeremiah with this question. Is there a word from the Lord? Jeremiah sent word right back. There is. <laughs> People started saying, what's the Lord saying? Is there a word from the Lord? I said, there is. <laughs> and, they, and they said, what is he saying? <laughs> and we talked about that for three months while we were at home. Well, don't want to get too far off base here. But during that tragedy, you think God was saying something to us? Oh, yeah, He was. The whole world, the scope, and it's still here. The scope of that thing. What was God saying? Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Even if you get sick, I'll give you rest. I'll give you that joy. That pervasive sin. And one of the things that's been hard to overcome is we just didn't see much joy in the believers during that time. It seemed like we saw anger and frustration. And what, were, what was the unbelieving world hearing from us who know God in the midst of that? Well, when I teach pastors, I always tell them in my preaching class, every time you preach, make sure you teach a little. And whenever you teach, make sure you preach a little. Well, I just got through preaching a little. <laughs> Let's go back to the enjoyable experience. You, we must learn to discern the Word of God. We've got to recognize His voice. Now, we can read the Bible, but you can read it cover to cover as often as you can and never hear God. Because it is a book of faith, seeking the Lord, desiring to hear from Him, is who He will re reveal Himself to. And of course, the best illustration of that is the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus said in John 5, you search the Scriptures because you think they t tell of me and you don't even know I'm here. <laughs> they knew the Bible backwards and forward. To be a Pharisee, you had to quote the Old Testament law. First five books of the, of the Bible. And, uh, and the Pharisees knew the Bible so well, and yet they missed Jesus Christ. And so the, the, uh, the thing that, we, that we've got to learn in this learning process, first of all, I've got to learn how to listen. I love that story in Luke chapter 2 when Jesus, there in Jerusalem with his family at the age of 12, remember the story? It says that uh, it came time to go back to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed. That's one of the main words of the, of the Bible. Jesus stayed in Jerusalem. 
And his family thought he was with other family. They all traveled together, went a whole day, got ready to camp for the night. No Jesus. Well, you couldn't travel at night, so they had to wait till the next day, all the way the day, the next day. When they finally found him on the third day, <laughs> kind of telling on Passover the third day after Passover, where'd they find him? In the temple. There's no verse on this, but kind of reading between the lines, I think when Jesus heard Joseph say, come on, let's head to the house, Jesus went to the temple. <laughs> the closest place of heaven on earth that he knew. And it says when his parents found him, they had, Mary asked him, why have you treated us like this? Didn't you know we were looking for you? Jesus answered with a question. <laughs> it's interesting. It, very cool. He said, why did you not know where you would find me? <laughs> because I must be. But it's about my father's book. But it says that he was sitting with the teachers of the law, listening to them and asking them questions. And they were amazed at his answers. One of the reasons we don't listen is because we don't sit down long. Some of you are sitting down the longest today you've been sitting. You've been up all day. I hope you don't go to sleep sitting still for this long, but you could. We don't sit down. We don't ask questions. Uh, we're not listening. But prayer is it starts as a listening experience, letting God take initiative in the conversation. Have you ever been around somebody that does all the talking besides somebody like me, like a pastor or a preacher? <laughs> that you just hope they've been there. <laughs> it's an amen. You can't get a word in. And you're, you, you'd like to, but you, you can't. They just have a barrage of words. You think God ever feels like that when we go into his presence to pray? Just giving him a huge to-do list and then out of there. Got that over with. Beloved, that is pure duty. And there is no delight in it. And what God desires for us is to enjoy his presence. And if we will listen to him, he, he will set the conversation for the time that we have with him. And uh, he, well, he, he wants us to know more than what we want him to know. <laughs> he already knows what we want him to know. But we don't know what he wants us to know. And so developing a listening ear. Now, I've given you some prayers for this with Scripture. I've actually given you seven prayers to, to pray. You get one a, one a night, one a morning. But start tonight. And it doesn't matter the difference what the order's in. It's an extra handout. Don't necessarily think you have to go in that order. But uh, uh, I've noticed that the older I get, the more I wake up at night. It's kind of like being a baby again, almost. I'm not crying, but, but I have found that this is a great time to pray. One of these prayers. And to meditate on what God has said. Because that is also praying. So the, the spiritual activity of listening requires, point number four, the spiritual activity of listening requires spiritual senses that are active. Uh, now what I mean by that is that the spiritual activity that the Holy Spirit initiates in you, with you, through you, uh, before the Father and watching world around you, requires spiritual senses. Now, there's a Greek word for this, actually. It's in Luke 2, describing Jesus. How, how he was... Uh, uh, they were amazed at his answers. It's also in a couple of Paul's prayers. It's in Hebrews 5, 14. Solid food is for the mature, for those who have their spiritual senses trained by constant use to distinguish good from evil. Now, we know our five physical senses, right? Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and feeling. And uh, those five 
physical senses is how we know the material world around us. Uh, without those senses, you don't know what's going on around you. You don't know reality. And uh, all five of those senses, physical senses, are totally dependent on outside stimulus. Your eye doesn't see anything unless light hits it. Your uh, taste and nose, you've got a, a ears, you, there's, a, there's a nerve in all five of your senses that receive a signal from the outside, feeling hot, cold, whatever, uh, uh, smelling. There's a nerve there, and it transmits that message to the brain for processing. And that's how you know something. And memory is tied to this so much. Well, your spiritual senses are not of this world. <laughs> and you're not either, by the way. When you were born from above, when Jesus became real to you, you entered a different world, beloved. You are not of this world. And so the five physical senses will not come in. Here's the reason. Because your spiritual senses respond to one stimulus, one and only one. You know what it is? The Word of God. And there's only one spiritual nerve and for all of your spiritual senses. I think you have more than five, and that is faith. Faith receives that signal, we could say, that Word, and transmits it to your heart where the Holy Spirit dwells for understanding. So learning to listen You've got to recognize that, first of all, we're talking about spiritual hearing. How many times did Jesus say, whoever has ears to hear? He's talking about spiritual hearing. And uh, the song that we sang from Psalm 119, verse 18, open my eyes. Paul was talking about that in Ephesians chapter 1, that we would receive a spirit of revelation and a knowledge of him in the, in, so that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened. You can't enlighten yourself. You can't empower yourself. You can't fill yourself. God does, and He operates by His Word to connect with your spiritual senses. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And so we've got to learn. got to get this in order. I want to learn how to listen to God. I want to be able to recognize His voice. Well, I need spiritual ears for that. And you can also hear by seeing. You can hear by feeling. Helen Keller's story tells you all about that. But you can, you can receive that word by faith with a multitude of different kind of uh, spiritual senses. But we want to activate so that we can access what God is doing in our lives. Beloved, when you do, you will see that, good grief, I don't think I really loved God. I liked Him a lot. <laughs> but, man, that love will grow. Why? Because He will reveal more and more as you are strengthened by your spiritual senses being exercised. Well, point number five, I've got to get, uh, keep moving here. And that is praying is the will of God for you. To do His will in you, with you, through you, as you, before the Father and the watching world around you. Now, God will work without you, but He doesn't want to. He wants, isn't it amazing? It's a mystery that God, will, God can do anything He wants to do, and yet He chooses to include us in what He wants to do. And beloved, that's the mystery of prayer. Look in your Bible at, at uh, Matthew chapter 16. It's a, another familiar passage of Scripture. We call it the, the great uh, revelation or the great confession of Simon Peter. But actually, it's a passage on prayer. And I'll, I'll explain that in just a few moments. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13. By the way, I'm kind of covering in your booklet, pages 1 through 9 tonight. So if you want to go home and read those later, we'll kind of fill in some gaps there. 
You know the story, Caesarea Philippi, where it is up in the north. Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged him not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Three times in the gospel, you'll find that binding and loosing thing. All three times is the context of prayer. This is the line that Jesus taught us, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God accomplishes his will through praying people because he does his work first in you. He's not going to do it without you. He wants to include you. Why? Because there is so much strength and joy when we see Him glorified. Amen. That's the best thing I've said in eight, nine months, I think. <laughs> of course, I hadn't been talking much the last eight months, but anyway. He wants to see it. He wants to say it first in you. Simon Peter got it. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. But Jesus said, you didn't learn that. You didn't think it. My Father just said it, and you heard it, and you said it. Back to me. That's praying, beloved. Hearing what God is saying, and then saying it back to Him, believing that it's true, and He'll do it. And we will watch Him be glorified and have great joy and strength because he didn't need to include us, but he did. Now listen, most of the time you won't have a clue as to what it means. <laughs> Peter sure didn't. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Oh, you're blessed. And that was a revelation and you prayed it. Which by the way, if you hear something tonight, that connects, write it down so that you can pray it tonight. Your notes become your prayer list because sometimes it comes like a flash, like Simon Peter, but other times it's kind of progressive, kind of like creation. It'll happen over time, which is one of the reasons you want to have a journal. I'll, I'll get into that next week. But, but Peter said, and then Jesus started talking about the mission of Messiah. Now here's what's going to happen. Now that you know who he is, now here's what's going to happen. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be turned over to the Gentiles. I'm going to be betrayed, flogged, crucified, and risen on the third day. Remember what Simon Peter said? No. No, you're not going to do that. And remember what Jesus said? <laughs> Get behind me. It kind of, Jesus would say things to Simon Peter from time to time and just shut him up. And he would. <laughs> You're not going away, John 14, 13. You're not going away. I'm going with you. I'll die for you. No, you won't, Simon. You're going to deny me three times. Peter didn't say anything for the rest of the chapters. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the point. Peter did not have a clue what it meant, what he was praying. He was just saying to Jesus what he heard the Father say. That is what it means to pray. And the reason that we don't enjoy more and don't see more, we're not listening when we pray. We're just doing our Bible reading and going through our prayer list and getting up and going on. And beloved, we're missing out on the great, the great joy. Well, I've got at least one good story I want to tell you. Do we quit at 7.30 or at 7.40? 7.35? Okay, good. Oh, don't tell me that. <laughs> Look at Psalm 2, because here's the, here's the Son of God and the Father, and it's one of the key passages, along with one we just saw, on uh, prayer. 
But the Old Testament version of this is in Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the kings set themselves against, and the rulers set, set themselves against the Lord and His anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds and break their shackles from us. Oh, that's not a description of today's world leadership. I don't know what is. He who sits in the heavens laughs and then speaks to them in his fury saying, as for me, I have set my king on my holy hill in Zion. The father is speaking to the rulers of the earth saying, I have a king and I have already established him on my holy hill in Zion. Look at verse 7. I will tell of the decree. Now the son is speaking. The king. I will tell of the decree. Who, what's the decree? The decree of the father who has set me as king. I will tell of the, de of the decree. Today I have begotten you. You are my son. Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your possessions. That is a picture for us of praying because we as adopted sons and daughters of God in Jesus Christ, He has also established. But here, I love this illustration. I never heard it before. Pastor Jason said last week, every checker has a crown on it. Amen. Every checker can be kinged, but you got to get to the end of the board. Okay, back to this. How will we rule? Oh, we could go back to Genesis 1 and 2 and really spend some time and dig. Because Adam and Eve were given that responsibility to have dominion and subdue creation. And God put them in a perfect environment to learn. To learn what? How to listen. How else could Adam have named all the animals? He couldn't have come up with all that. No, he was listening. And it was perfect. And God gave him five commands. That's all. Be fruitful and multiply. Oh, do we have to? <laughs> no, you'll love it. <laughs> to tend and keep the garden. There's two more. Have dominion over all of creation. Freely eat. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to hear that command? One fruit has a different purpose. It's not for eating. And you could call it fasting. One fruit, don't eat. It has a different purpose. For the day that you eat it, you will really die. Five commands. But here's the point. All Adam and Eve needed to do was to hear what God said and then speak it like Jesus is in Psalm 2. And good grief. There they were. <laughs> Paradise. No clothes, no kids, no neighbors. Are you kidding me? How, how do you mess that up? <laughs> this is, we don't have time to go to chapter 3. But, but we know the story. I'll tell you what. They stopped listening. And stopped the conversation. And started entertaining a conversation with the snake. We can choose who we listen to and what kind of conversation we have with who that... And that's what praying is all about. Well, when you're praying, you're speaking what God is saying and then watching Him do it. Because He's the only one that can do His will. And the mystery of prayer is that He invites us in on that so that we can learn how to rule and reign with Christ forever. Beloved, this is a school that we're in right now. Learning how to listen. Well, I think I've already gone over the action plans for you. A couple of the action plans are on the back. Learn to recognize God's voice. We'll get into that next week because I want to tell you this story. Because I know you've probably had the experience I have I was, at one particular time, I was praying about an opportunity, actually. And I said, Lord, I don't, I don't know if that's you opening a door. 
or if that's me just wanting to go there, or if that's the devil tempting me to go there. Have you ever had that, well, ever wondered about it? Lord, if I could know it's you, it's a no-brainer to do it. But I don't know if it's you, or it's me, or it's the devil. You know what I heard God say? Oh, son, there's a huge difference between those three people. <laughs> Duh. And then here's the verse that came to me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. I am the good shepherd. I am known by the Father, and I know the Father. As I know him, so you know me. And basically what I heard was, if you don't know the difference between those three voices, you're in big, bigger trouble than you thought you were. <laughs> And I determined that I was going to learn how to recognize his voice. Now, just in case something happens between now and next Wednesday, let me go ahead and tell you. When God speaks, it will always, almost always be about himself, not you. Because he wants you to know him. And we don't know him like we could. Now, you will get a lot of Praise and condemnation. You know where that's coming from? That's the devil and the flesh. Praising you. Oh, boy, I think you're learning how to pray. You've got it down now. Way to go. What happens with that kind of pats on the back? Pride. Nothing about that is God. Or condemnation. You're sorry. You're no good. You shouldn't even be around those good people. That's the devil. But God, when he speaks, will say something about himself. When I was learning this, I heard God clearly say, I want to spend more time with you. <laughs> I knew it was God. Because the devil would have said, you don't pray enough. Oh, man. 59 minutes to go. <laughs> I don't pray enough. Well, I guess I better pray more. But you see, God was revealing something of his heart. I want to spend more time with you. You know what we started doing? <laughs> Praying more. <laughs> because I thought, you want to spend more time with me? Good grief. That's awesome. Let me tell you a quick story. So I've been teaching this for... Oh, ever since I left here. Sorry. But anyway, down there in Corpus Christi, we took a lot of groups to Uganda, one of our groups, a lot of university students, and Sarah was there, and uh, boy, she just soaking up everything. Well, we were in Brussels, right, sitting all together next to the British Airways counter, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw this lady coming with a baby crying, and, and I, I could tell she was coming straight to me, and, I, and she was crying. And so I stood up because she came straight to me, and she was crying, heavy accent. I could barely understand her. But what she was saying was, someone stole my bag out of the plane, my bag. I don't have my bag. My passport's in there. My baby's formula's in there. My ticket to home, I can't, uh, I don't know. And she was crying, crying the baby. <laughs> And so I said, well, look, look, she said, sit down, sit down. So she sat down there, and, and she, she was just crying. And I said, well, look, we're believers, and we're going to pray, okay? We're going to pray. Preachers say that when there's, we don't know what else to say. <laughs> we're we're going to pray. So always, you know, women with women, men with them. So I said, Sarah, why don't you pray, Sarah? So we bowed our heads. And you could, all you could hear was that baby coming, and the lady. <laughs> and so, it, well, nothing happened. So I, I looked up, and Sarah was just sitting there, this smile on her face. And I thought, she didn't hear me. She didn't hear me ask her to voice the prayer. So I just sat there for a few minutes. You know how awkward silence is. <laughs> and, and so I was about to say, Sarah, would you? And all of a sudden, Sarah said, oh, thank you, God. You're bringing the bag. You're awesome. And I thought, wait, Sarah, don't say that yet. We, <laughs> we don't have the bag. Oh, she just said, thank you, God. You're bringing the bag? 
Already? You are so awesome to help this lady. And all of a sudden, the ladies from the British Airways counter came walking over. They said, we heard you, and that bag is coming right now. We just got word they found this bag, and they're bringing it. And I said, Amen. <laughs> you are awesome, God. Thank you. <laughs> well, the lady kept crying. I said, What's your, you're still crying? I'm crying to tears of joy now. And so we talked some more about the Lord, and she tied her bag and went, went on her way. So when she did, I looked at Sarah. I said, Sarah, I didn't know if you heard me or not. And I said, would you pray? She gave me a strange look. She said, Pastor Bubba, I was listening. You remember how you taught us to listen before we pray? And I heard God say, I got the bag. I'm bringing it now. I said, well, amen. Yeah, I do remember teaching that, and I'm glad you were listening. <laughs> Here's your assignment, beloved. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, 24. It's a prayer, and uh, it's a prayer to be made holy completely. That's why it's the God of peace. Shalom, wholeness. May the God of peace sanctify you completely. Your whole body, soul, and spirit. That's all of you. Completely kept blameless until the day of Christ. He who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Now that's your assignment. I've given you seven more prayers that you can pray. Now, if you wanted the short version of that prayer in 1 Thessalonians, it's this. Lord, make me holy like the seventh day. Make me completely holy because only God can make you holy. And He won't until you ask Him. He wants you to want what He wants for you. Now, for those that want extra credit, there's no such thing. Don't pray anything except that for a week. Now you say, well, what, what about my prayer list? Yeah, I'll pray it for them too. Because when Jesus taught us to pray, our Father, He was talking about you and those on your prayer list. That's who we are. And God, just, just try it. Learn these other, add these other seven prayers. Just a one prayer a day from that seven list. Just pray it. Watch God do it. For His glory and for your joy and strength. Well, we'll pick up God willing here next week and talk about a journal and talk about some more prayers from the Bible and how you can understand them. Again, just in case something happened between now and then. John 13 through 17 is the concentrated teaching on praying because Jesus was going away, would not be with them anymore, and Jesus knew the joy, the greater joy that they were going to experience in continuing to learn from Him, living in them forever through praying. The five chapters on prayer, like no other ones in the Bible. We'll refer to them next week. No time for questions. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, please join me. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom, Father. Yours is the power, Holy Spirit. And yours is the glory, Lord Jesus Christ, before time, now, and forever. Amen. And hallelujah. All right, next week I'll try to do some question time. <laughs>